this book of Ephesians was the letter that Paul wrote back to the church. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 2 is where I'm going to start. And uh, I just want to give you the tone of the letter again. I talked about this last week. He said, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ. How many of you are faithful in Jesus Christ? <laughs> Hey, try to be anyway, okay? You're really working hard to be faithful in Christ. This is for you. But listen to the tone he says. He says in verse 2, Grace to you and peace to you. Man, I could stop right there and preach a message on those two words over your life tonight. Not only do you receive grace, but you give grace. And there are people that I can tell without it, with them even saying to me if they've truly received God's grace in their life. Because you show it. Amen? You're going to see that in Ephesians 2 tonight. And sometimes we, we receive better than we give. Amen? Well, tonight I want you to receive God's grace in your life. And I, I'm not talking about just the fact that you're saved, but I'm talking about you may be in a situation, in a battle in your mind over something tonight, and I just want to speak grace over your life. The grace of God. And he says, grace and peace. The peace of God over your life. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The heavenly sends that to you tonight. Grace and peace. Amen? Receive it. Chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 is where we're going to be. A lot of, lot of stuff in here that is going to bless you tonight. Uh, when we work through that, I told you we were going to go through this line by line and just listen, let these words come alive on, on Wednesday night, more of a, of a teaching to you, but I'll be preaching some too, don't worry. Because there's some stuff to shout about in Ephesians chapter 2. Very first sentence, listen to what he says. You, that's you. Put your, put your name everywhere he says you in this chapter, put your name in it. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Verse 2, in which you once walked. Everybody in here walked a different life than what you do right now. Amen? And it's real important that you remember where you came from. It's real important that you don't forget that God saved you from a lifestyle that was doomed to hell itself. Because when we see people living contrary to the Word of God, we need to show that same grace to them. You once walked according to the course of this world. And I'm going to tell you what, that course of the world is always screaming right in front of our face, get back on my path, is it not? Get back in my mindset. Set your things, set your sights and your mind on the things around you, the things that the world has to offer. It's always in front of us. According to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. There is a spirit alive and well working on this earth through the sons of disobedience. And let me just say, not only that spirit, but what he says is, that spirit used to be in me and you. And I'm going to say this to someone who's struggling. That spirit, I believe, is always knocking at the door. Always wanting to come back. Amen? <laughs> but, but remember what verse 1 said. He made us alive. You're alive tonight. You can remind the enemy. If he's been lying to you and messing with you, you're alive in Christ tonight. Let's get back to verse number 3. Among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just like others. Now stop right here for a minute before we go any further. He, he's reminding us, he's, Paul is reminding you and me what we used to be. Now let me help somebody tonight. If you've said yes to Jesus, this is not you anymore. Amen? Amen. Now let me, help, let me help someone else. You, you may still carry some old habits, amen? How many of you have bad habits? Two of you. That's real good. We're real good. I thought there would at least be three. 
but you have bad habits and so what the enemy wants you to think see you still do that so you don't really belong to Jesus Christ and I'm telling you that's not true what's true is is the Word of God that's why it's so important that we do take a slow step through the Word so you can understand that just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you are who you used to be look where you are on Wednesday night amen you're at church not at buy one get one free night somewhere if you know what I'm talking about <laughs> you, you are you've come to the place to say I need God's Word to come alive inside of me I need his spirit inside of me because I don't want to go back where I came from how many of you don't want to go back <laughs> like it was a mess back there but I'm telling you the war that's raging against you is for you to go back but it's not gonna happen it's not gonna have we're not gonna give we're not gonna give the enemy that stuff back anymore amen so he he goes into the very beginning of this chapter and he says this is everything you used to be everything you used to be now look at the first two words of verse 4 but God I literally could shut the message down right here and send you home with those two words but God so, and, and, and I'm not going to try to bust anybody's chops tonight, but sometimes we say things that aren't really theologically correct. When we say things like, I decided to change my life and get it right. Uh-uh. No. God is what got you right. God is what got you right. Now, you're going to see in a little while that if we say yes to God, that we do change the way we do things. But it all started with God saying, I'm going to send my son to die on a cross so you're not living in that wicked life anymore. You are now, he said it, alive. You're alive. Somebody can say amen right there. You're alive. And not only are you alive now, listen to me, but you're going to live forevermore. You will live forevermore. You do not have to fear death. You don't have, how many of you have, have I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room has been around someone who was a true believer. I mean, true believer. And man, they said, it don't matter what happens to me. Like, you know, they were on their deathbed or they had been real sick. They said, it just don't matter. I know where I'm going. I'm going home. Amen. That's why sometimes if you, if you go into some Christian uh, funeral services, it's more, they call it a celebration. Now, I mean, the flesh cries out, and it hurts, and I get it. I mean, we all go through that, but I'm telling you, the truth is you live forevermore. I'm alive in Christ. Not only do you live forevermore, but he says you can have life and life more abundantly right here. But God. I'm going to ask you this question tonight. Now, this, this is the extreme of our life because he said, you were walking in darkness, you were dead in your trespasses, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. So he says, you were dead, but God made you alive. That is the ultimate. If God could take you from death to life, he can do anything else. He can take you from sick to well, he can take you from broke to having some money. He can take you from mean to nice. Whatever your, whatever your dysfunctional mess is, God can do the opposite. But God. And so I would ask you the question tonight, what area of your life needs to say, but God? And I'm going to tell you, you've got to train yourself to be careful what you say. Like, I mean, I, I'm told you, I'm not here to mess with anybody tonight, but I'm going to tell you the hardcore truth. Everything you say negative in your life, you should follow it with those two words, but God. I can't, but God can. I don't have the answer, but God does. My sister, she's crazy, but God, amen? You know, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter if God can do it. The, the question is, do you believe it? Well, I, I'm going to tell you, I have to believe it because I know how dead I was in my sin. I can take you literally to a place in central Alabama where I walked on a, on a sidewalk and looked at this broken thing and said, I, I said it to myself, my life could never change. And God heard that, God heard that statement too. 
Little did I know there was a but God to be added on the end of that sentence. And there is a but God to be added on the sentences of your life today. So that's what I'm saying. I really could end this message right here, Ephesians 2, and say it really is God has the final say. And there's one thing the enemy wants us to do is put a period at the end of everything we say or take, take the response that some other human gives us and leave God out of the equation. Let me tell you what. If God can take you from death to life, he can take anything in your life and turn it around if he desires to. Amen. Amen. That's faith. We believe that. That's why we celebrate. That's why we praise. That's why we jump and clap because we know our God is fighting for us. Amen. Amen. And listen to me, somebody. God is fighting for you tonight. Amen. You might be in the lowest moment of your life. Let me tell you something. You're not going to die there. Amen. Why? Because God is not through with you yet. Amen. Amen. Listen to this again, verse 4. I want to read this slow. God, but God who is rich. How many of you got a rich uncle somewhere? You know, <laughs> you like to visit him at Christmas. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. How many of you don't have a rich uncle? <laughs> you know, a, nobody in your family's got nothing. You got a <laughs> couple of you raise your hands back there. I know who you are. When he says rich, when we think rich, we think in terms of monetary. I mean, that's just the way we are. It's the, it's the economy we live in, the, the uh, American uh, culture we live in. We think of things. We think of big houses and fancy cars, you know, red Corvettes and stuff like that. And, but when God says, I'm rich, he says, I'm rich in mercy. I'm rich in mercy. God who is rich in mercy. Meaning, what the mercy did for you was take you from death, hell, and the grave to life forevermore. And only God has the ability to do that. And I want to encourage someone tonight, if, listen to me carefully. If God has the ability to do that for you, He can do anything in your life. And I believe somebody tonight, you need to look at a situation you're going through and you need to take a stand and say, hold on a minute, I, I've talked about it, I've argued about it, I've been confused about it, but tonight I'm going to say this, but God can fix it. Because it's in his word. Amen. And I'm going to say it over and over until he does fix it. Amen. Because he's rich in mercy. Because of what? His great love. Amen. He loves you so much. With which he loved us. Even when we were dead. Let me tell you. God loves you the same right now with you singing and clapping. That he did when you were fully away from him. Think about that for a minute. We don't love like that. I mean, we try to love like that. Like we love people that do stuff. For, you know what I'm saying? You know how we love. But I mean, God said, I loved you at the lowest, worst place in your life. That's when I loved you the most. That's mercy. Now, I'm going to slow down and say this for a minute. If that's the way God loved us, that's the way we should love other people. I'm talking about a kind of love that only comes from heaven. That's not easy, church. We were dead in trespass. He made us alive together with who? Christ. Alive with Christ. Guess what? Christ is alive and well today. And you're alive with him. And you're going to live forevermore. Man, when you think about this right here, it makes our problems seem a whole lot smaller than what they really are. You know, I know you had a flat tire and, you, you know, you couldn't afford to, but nothing but bologna sandwiches at the store. But listen, you're going to reign and live with Christ one day. Uh, that's big news. Tell the debt collector that when he calls. <laughs> I'm going to live with Christ one day. Bye. <laughs> They'll still come get your couch down here, but whatever. Let me tell you, if you get your couch repoed, that's bad trouble. I'm just going to say that. I, I, I'm not going to say anything else. But we're alive with Christ. Listen, by grace you have been saved. You've been saved by the grace of God. That's it. You, you, I mean, in your mind, you think you made a conscious decision to come to Jesus, and you did. But in all reality, you were saved by His grace. He poured out His grace before you ever said yes. If He didn't pour out His grace before you said yes, you would be dead on the side of the road somewhere. 
You would have walked out of some bar somewhere, shot in the head, gone. But he poured out his grace, and then finally one day we woke up and said, I'm going to really receive this in my life. And when you received it, here's what happened. This is where people miss it. This is where people miss it. They think God's going to come in like this Mickey Mouse thing and touch, and everything's just going to change to gold. No, what happens is your soul was, had a place reserved in heaven when you said yes. That was what was important to God. Let me tell you why, because that's where he's at. And he said, the first thing I'm going to get right in your life is I'm going to make a place for you to spend eternity with me. You remember when those guys, they, they bring his, this friend of theirs, it's in uh, the book of Mark, and they bring this friend of theirs to Jesus and they can't get in the house because there's so many people and they take him up on the roof and they cut a hole in the roof and they let the guy down. And as he's coming down, they took the man there so Jesus would touch his legs so he would walk again. But as he's coming down the roof, Jesus looks at him and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, one of the friends might have said, Well, we, we didn't come here for that. We wanted him to walk again, you know. <laughs> and that's why people come to God, because they want things fixed that's really not that important to God. Now, God will do anything. Don't misunderstand me, but the most important thing is this. I want your soul to be set right. By grace, you have been saved. And if heaven's not enough for you, you're going to have a hard time walking with God. But I know this. God will bless your life too, amen? <laughs> I don't want to minimize the blessings we have in our life, but I'm telling you it's about salvation first. By grace you've been saved. And raised up together and made us what? Sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. From dead sin, we're going to sit in heavenly places. You ever met somebody that's done that? Nope, you haven't. <laughs> this is all by faith. This is by faith, we believe. But I'll tell you this. That's why Paul goes into the letter. He said, remember where you came from. If God can bring you that far from that place to this place, He can surely get you from this place to the heavens our ultimate home. That's why we celebrate. And here's the thing that we have to know. If heaven is that good and it's so wonderful, I want to take as many people with me as I can. Verse number 7. That in the age to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's powerful there. Listen to the next verse. For by grace... He says it again. It's important that you get it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By faith you believed and grace saved you. And that not of yourself. There is nothing you've done that created a way for you to heaven. You understand that? Let me say this. When, when Jesus was hanging on a cross, there were... Two other people hanging with him. And they lived a life of total destruction. Criminals. Never even went to Sunday school. Didn't even come and hear me preach one time, okay? Never had John's coffee, none of that stuff. But let me, sh let me show you what grace looks like. And people that work hard for Jesus have a hard time with this. Just like the other, the prodigal son's brother had a hard time with that situation. The man was hanging on the cross, and one, one criminal looked at him and he said, if you are who you say you are, get me down from here. And the other one looked at him and says, you don't even know who you're talking to. As he's hanging on a death sentence, he said, that's the son of the living God, Jesus. And what did Jesus say to that man? He said, today I will see you in paradise. Grace was poured out on his life in his last moment. In his last words, God poured grace. As long as you have breath, listen to me, you can receive the grace of God in your life. Now, if you walk around living your life like this, I'll do whatever I want because at the last moment, I'll cry out for grace. <laughs> you ain't that slick, okay? <laughs> You're not. You're only fooling yourself. But let me tell you, that's, that's grace right there. 
That's why, you know, if you've ever been in a situation, if you, you know, I see it a lot of times in the ministry. I've, I've dealt with it a few times, and I've gone to someone, and it's a family member's called and said, hey, so-and-so is on their deathbed, and, and we don't know. Can you, go, can you go say the sinner's prayer with them? And I said, I'll go. I'll go. And, and I'm sitting there. I'll never forget. I was talking to this one old, older gentleman, and he's crying. Everything he had ever done wrong in his life was hitting him on the weight of his shoulder. He couldn't even breathe hardly. And I reminded him of the story of the thief on a cross. I said, that man had one chance, and it worked, because that's God's grace. I said, do you have enough faith to believe? And he said, I do. I said, then you're going to experience God's grace today. I've seen it more than once. Or God's grace just... Whew. Why? Because God desires that we be with Him in heaven. He desires that. And He made a way for us. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Let me, let me say this. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself... Grace is the gift. Grace is the gift for you. And I want to say this tonight. Probably somebody in this room needs to receive that gift again. Now, I'm not going to say that you're not saved. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You might not be, and you may want to just say, please, make sure I'm saved. Amen? That's fine, too. But I'm going to say you need to receive the gift of grace for some other areas of your life. There are some areas of your life that you're holding on to, that you're beating yourself up over, that there's things out of your control you can do nothing about, you're hurting about things that have happened. Listen, you need to receive God's grace in your life tonight. And listen, if His grace is strong enough to get you from death to life, it's strong enough to get you out of what you're currently in tonight. It is the gift of God. Here he says it again. Not of works. I don't care how many days you come here and work, how much stuff you do for this church, God's grace is not going to come to you any freer than if you say, Lord, give me your grace. I think, I think the stumbling block for us as a church is when we have the ability to show grace and we don't. And then God says, well, if you're not going to show grace, why should I give you grace? You understand what I'm saying? For those of us that are still walking this journey out, that's why it's so important. Don't forget where you came from. Don't be so hard on people. Amen? Don't be so hard on people. Show a little grace. Not of works, lest anyone should... It's like, you know, look what I did. I gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> okay? Okay? No, I, I accepted the grace that God had for a sinner. I didn't give anything to him. He gave it all. He gave it all there, and I came and received what he did, the gift of God. And I want to encourage someone tonight to receive that gift again in your life. Receive God's grace in your life. Verse number 10. Listen, now he changes this thing, and, and he goes into a whole nother... I mean, he, he reminds us of where we came from and how we got where we're going, basically, in the first part of this chapter. Death to life because of God's grace. Really, you could say it like this. Death but God, now I'm alive. <laughs> That's the Christian life right there, period. Let me say that one more time. You were dead, now you're alive. Hallelujah. Amen. We're alive in Christ. Now he goes in and he, he starts to talk about like kind of what's happening on earth now with this thing. If you have received his grace, he says, you are, it, you are his workmanship. Oh, that's something totally different right there. I mean, not, we, we know we're going to heaven, but he says, here you're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is so huge right there. God prepared everything about your life before you were ever born. 
Think about that for a minute. Those that are in Christ, okay? When you come and you live in Christ and you decide, I'm going to walk in Christ, God said, I had it all worked out. I had it all worked out. I was, I was talking to somebody today. I don't even remember who it was, and we made a comment. Uh, oh, it was my daughter's nine-year-old birthday. Woo. Bailey, that's right. And somebody said to her, I wish I was nine years old again. <laughs> And I said, well, what would you do different? And, and she thought about it for a minute. She says, hmm, I don't know what I'd do different. <laughs> I would say, it don't matter what you would do different. You want to know why? Because it only matters when you say yes to Jesus. Amen. Now, obviously, if I know now, ooh, if I'd have known it back then, I probably still wouldn't be standing here right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but God knew. God knows. And listen, that's why faith is so important because God knows exactly where he's taking you right now. God knows exactly what you're walking through right now. He knows every heartache, every tear, everything, every joy, everything. He knows exactly what you're going through right now, and it matters to him. Because you are his workmanship. He is working this thing out for you. How many of you wish you'd work a little faster? <laughs> I'm with you. I am with you, but that's not how it is. Created in Christ for what? This is important. For good works. If you are in Christ, you should be doing good works. We should be doing good. As a church, we should be doing good work in this community. We should be doing good work in people's lives. We should not come in here 10 hours a day and bury our head in this altar and moan and groan and think we're doing something for God. We have got to put our hands to the plow and the kingdom of God and get out in our community and do good work for God. Amen? Amen. Now, the thing is, if we did the good work or not, it wouldn't matter. We're going, to, we're going to heaven, right? But in Christ, I am compelled by the love of Christ to get out and do something good for God. You, it's impossible not to. Sometimes we get lazy, amen? But God is going to help us which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, he goes back. He, he wants these people in Ephesus, don't forget where you came from now. When you get all high and mighty and spiritual, don't forget where you came from. Therefore, remember, somebody say that word, remember, <laughs> that you... Once Gentiles in the flesh, Gentiles away from God, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You weren't even God's people. And strangers from the covenant of the promise. Man, aren't you glad you're not a stranger to God anymore? Aren't you glad you're not a stranger to the promise? You don't have to beg for the promises of God. You really don't. You have an inheritance in Christ. Now, this is where it gets, it gets real, real weird, especially in America, because the prosperity message has gone out so much that people think, well, God's just going to give me all this stuff. That is not what it means. The first thing God's going to give you is grace. And I'm going to show you in a minute what I believe the second thing is. That you're, you're, you're not a stranger of the covenant, having no hope. We got hope. What's our hope? Christ. I'm going to heaven. I'm not afraid to get up and, and drive down the interstate tomorrow. I'm not. I, I'm going to go to heaven. And when it's time for me to go to heaven, guess what? I'm going. As long as God has breath in my, my body, I'm going to work for the Lord. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to live in fear that something may happen to me. I'm not going to live in fear that something's going to happen to my family because my family knows about heaven. Okay? My church knows about heaven. We're, we, we, are, we are not strangers of the covenant of the promise. So we don't live in fear, having no hope without God in the world. Man, that's a hard way to live in this world without God, isn't it? Well, here's the crazy thing. We are inundated with messages by people who don't know who God is. Amen? How many of you watch the local news? Uh, yeah, I'll watch it. I know you do. 
trying to see if somebody from church made the news tonight. That's why I watch it. No, I don't. I don't watch it for that. I mean, but, you know, the, it's like the news is crazy, man. It's like, what? I mean, you see some crazy stuff. South Florida news is the worst. Like all kind of weird stuff. And it's like a world without God is all around us. I mean, that is the world we live in. Not only uh, that, that it's without God, but we're at a place now where people are, are going and, and bashing God with their mouth and, and just, just this, this craziness. And you know it's craziness because if people knew the promises of God, why would you do that? Like, I get people in, in those places that have never heard the message. I, I can understand that one. But in this country, in this place, no, sir. But now in Christ Jesus, he, he, again, he's reiterating. Now, you've got to understand this letter, he keeps reiterating not to forget where you were. And I'm telling you, that's important in your journey tonight. Don't forget where you were the next time you go off on somebody. Because you don't like their stupidity. Because one time you lived like that too. Amen? But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ brought you near. Brought me near to what? Brought me near to salvation. Brought me near to heaven. Brought me near to the promises of God. Brought me near to the grace of God. And somebody tonight, you, you can be encouraged by this word because you are living like you're far off, but I'm here to tell you you're not. Because the enemy wants you to think you're far off. The enemy wants you to look at your current situation and, and take that and filter it through your feelings and then determine where you are. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. You take the spirit man tonight, filter it through the word of God, and you understand how good you really are and how close to God's promises you really are. Are you with me tonight, church? Now, I love the next part because he goes into the next, the next area of promise that I believe God wants to give you tonight. First, it was grace. The second one is peace. For he himself is our... He is our... So you don't have to say, Lord, send me... Peace of mind. No, send me Jesus. Because he is my peace. What is, what is Isaiah 9, 6? Let me see if we can pull it up real quick. This was, this was, you know, told by the prophet long before Jesus ever came. He said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. Somebody watching Fox News or something needs to hear this right here. All the stuff going on in our country right now, it belongs to Jesus. You got it? Belongs to Jesus. It's on his shoulder. All we see is what men do to stuff. I'll keep going. And his name will be called, listen to this, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Back to what Paul writes the church. He said, he is your peace. Amen. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace. You remember tonight, I think when David came up here, he was talking about saying the name of Jesus. When you, when, listen to me. When you say the name of Jesus, you're, you're asking for peace to come into your life. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to trip anybody out tonight, but you, you can't say, send, send me peace. No, just send me Jesus. Amen. Let me sing to Jesus. <laughs> Let me sing about Jesus right now because he's my peace. Amen. And somebody in this room needs to experience his peace tonight. Here's the thing about it. Here's, here's where we get. I get there too. We, we get into the natural with this. We say, okay, if I could fix this and get this right, and if I get this over here and, you know, all that comes together, when it all comes together, I'll be fine. Let me tell you, you need to be fine if it's all broke. If it don't ever get right. I mean, you've been broke for how long? You know what I'm saying? You catch my drift? It's because it's his peace that's going to come no matter what your life is like. I'm just messing. I don't know what your money looks like. This is a joke. But I'm telling you, I've seen too many people that actually have nothing that have so much peace in their life. 
And if you go to any part of the world, which a lot of you in this room have come from other places and seen parts of the world where people don't have a lot of stuff, but they got a lot of something in them, that they get up every morning with a smile on their face and they just say, you know, God's so good. Who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, tore the veil. There's nothing between us and God anymore. There's nothing separating us from all the stuff that God has for us. Jesus is our peace. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. There, in other words, there's no more law that you got to live a certain way, get everything right, and then you're right with God. That was the law. No, now the law is peace. It's, it's, it's this. I came to Jesus. Well, in him you have everything because he, he was everything that came here and died, rose again, so that you could have a part of him living in you. His flesh, it said abolished in his flesh. When he died on the cross, he took everything, the law, all of it. He said, it's done. It is finished is what he said. No more of this stuff. In me, you're full. That is a promise right there. Thus making peace, verse 16. That he might reconcile them both to God, one body, through the cross thereby putting to death the enmity. There's nothing between us and God anymore. As long as the blood, as long as we confess Jesus, God ain't mad at you. God ain't trying to get you. God's not silent to you. He, he knows right where you're at. What did he say? What did Paul tell him? You're his workmanship. He's working this life out for you. And as long as you and I walk away and we walk our life without the Word and out the Spirit, we'll say, okay, i got to have this and i got to do that and I need this. No, no, no. I'm going to submit myself to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to submit my life to the journey. Uh, Pastor Will talked about it today. I mean, excuse me, Sunday. I'm going to submit my life to the journey that God takes me on. Now, how many of your journey has taken some weird twists and turns and bumps along the way? And he came, listen to this, he came and preached peace to you who were afar off. He came and preached it. Read his words. Read the, read, read the red letters of Jesus to those who were far off and to those who were near, to the whole world. It was for everybody. Verse 18. For through him we have access by one spirit to the Father. I have access to the creator of the universe tonight. I'm not going to make it all the way through this. <laughs> it's okay. Here's what I want you to do tonight. First thing I want you to do is receive God's grace in your life. I'm going to say it like this first. If you've sinned and you've been living in sin, listen to me. Receive God's grace in your life tonight. Receive God's grace in your life. It's real simple. We could do it the old-fashioned way where they would say, Come forth, come stand right here, raise your hands. Confess your sin. You can do that. You can sit right where you're at and say, Lord Jesus, I confess my sin to you tonight because I want to receive your grace. And I'd venture to say that's probably going to be most of us in this room tonight. Lord, I have sinned and I want to receive your grace. That washes you clean. Powerful prayer. Lord, there's some areas of my life that are still broken. Some areas in my life that aren't right, that aren't, aren't fixed, that, are, that are just aren't right. Give me grace in those areas tonight. He said it was the gift of God was grace. God, give me your peace tonight. Give me you so I can have your peace tonight. 
I have situations. I have a mind that is going 100 miles an hour, worrying, thinking. I'm going through this stuff in my... Give me the peace of Jesus Christ tonight. He is your peace. There, there are people sitting in this room and you've been through something in your life even recently or, or in the past that's just been very traumatic and you, you, you ask yourself, and you know, how does this ever get back to normal? First of all, it doesn't, but I'll tell you what, Jesus can replace what you've lost. That's the only way. There are some things we walk through that only Jesus can fix. Receive his peace tonight. Let me read you the last two verses here, verse number Actually, 19, we'll start there. Now, therefore, I'm just going to read it to you. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom, listen to this, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, you, are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We are part of the household of faith. This is, this is the New Testament church. That we don't have to go find God in a building. That was, that was the old thing. We're, we're in the new. He said Jesus now is the cornerstone of what he's built, his church, his house, his dwelling. But here's the thing. But the Spirit of God is going to come and dwell in, in you. Stand to your feet tonight. I say this, Lord, send the Spirit. Send that Spirit to dwell in my heart tonight. Send the Spirit to dwell in this church. Let me tell you, the, the Spirit comes and lives in, in us, okay? That, that is what the Bible says, that we are building a place for the Spirit to dwell. I want the people of Life Point Church to be a house for the Spirit of God. Amen. Some of you are walking through situations. Listen to me. You're walking through situations, and the reason you're in the situation is because God wants the Spirit to be in that situation. And He's going to send the Spirit to you. And you're just going to keep walking. That's what He said. You're going to walk. You're His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Because the Spirit is alive and well inside of us tonight. Amen. Ephesians 2. But God. <laughs> You'll use that a few times this week, I promise you. But God. Grace. Peace. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we receive your word tonight. We stand on your word tonight. God, I believe you're creating a, a church here, a place for the Holy Spirit to dwell in people's lives. And Lord, we all can testify tonight, but not for God, but God brought us to this place. And Lord, I believe there's people in situations in their life, and, and tonight they're going to say, I thought it was over, but God. But God showed up going to receive your grace and your peace tonight in Jesus name and everybody said amen church God bless you tonight